Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to our week three of our CCNA short course where today we're going to talk about routing. Um, okay, so the attendees, you guys are just starting to come in so I might just hold up a little bit. So there may have been some confusion about the actual timing of uh, this webinar this week. Um, our daylight saving change for the time zone I'm in, which is um, the Australian Eastern Standard Time, comes into effect next week. So we'll be plus 11 hours on UTC next week. Um, but at least we've got some people in, so we'll push on. Now, um, firstly, I'll just uh, apologise for uh, my voice. If it um, breaks up at any time, I've got a bit of a cold this week, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Okay, so if we're looking at our week three topics, um, we're looking at routing this week, but we're not going to cover everything because there's just far too much ground to cover. Um, we'll look at most of the intricacies you need to understand to get by in the CCNA exam, um, but there still is an awful lot of stuff that you need to know if you want to need to go further. Um, the routing protocols, um, well, I'll hang on, let's have a look at this. So, routing, so we're going to look at some basics. Uh, basic understanding of what routing is, difference between routed and routing protocols and how routers build their information tables. We're going to do some basic configuration using our Cisco Online Labs. We're going to have a look at the difference, um, as I said, between routing and routing protocols. Look at static routing and two dynamic routing protocols. So there's only two dynamic routing protocols that are now uh, covered on the CCNA exam and they are EIGRP and OSPF. Um, there used to be RIP also as well, but that's been taken out in the current iteration of the exam. Okay, so let's have a look at our routing, routing basics. So routing is basically the process... Oops, remember that? Remember that. That's a PDF warning. So basically, uh, routing is a process of sending a packet of information from one network to another network. Okay. So routes are usually based on the destination network, if you remember, and not the destination host. So although we can have host routes, they're, they're only used in rare circumstances. So usually routing is based on the actual destination network address. Okay, <coughs> so to perform to route, routers build routing tables um, that contain uh, destination network and subnet masks, the next hop, which is the next link or next router in which you have to get to to get that destination network and routing metrics and administrative distance for each of those networks and protocols. Um, really our routing protocols that we're looking at in terms of our CCNA exam now, we're only really worried about one um, layer or one or two layer three protocols, so that's IPv version 4 and IPv6. Okay, things like EIGRP can do other protocols like Apple Talk IPX you won't see a lot of those, they're not tested on the exam, so we won't, um, we won't spend too much time on them. Okay, now hang on, just before I get to this, just want to talk about um, when, when, we, when we do our routing, it's very important that you understand that to determine the best route to a destination, a router will consider three different things, okay, and, and these are in order. So it'll, it will look at the prefix length, prefix length. So in other words, the subnet mask. So whether it's a slash 8, a slash 16, slash 24, slash 32, whatever. Looks at the closest match. It will then look at metric, which is um, the distance to a particular network that's within a routing protocol. Okay, And then it will look at administrative distance, which is basically... Um, a measure of how trustworthy a routing protocol actually is. Okay, so keep those three things in mind as, uh, as we move along. Okay, so a routed protocol is a layer three protocol that applies logical addressing to end hosts. Okay, so an example, IPv4, IPv6, and for the older people um, floating around, IPX, Apple Talk, DECnet, Apollo, Vines, you name it, all those sort of protocols are routed protocols. So they are protocols that can be routed. Okay, they apply addresses to particular hosts. 
and they are used to route traffic backwards and forwards. Okay, so that they are routed protocols. They can be routed. Then we have a routing protocol. Now the routing protocol dynamically builds a view of the network and the directions in which you have to go to reach certain destinations. Okay, so it's like your roadmap. So examples of that. So there's, so there's two broad categories of routing protocols. So there's what's called an IGP, which is interior gateway protocol, and there's an EGP, which is an exterior gateway protocol. So as an example, IGP, Interior Gateway Protocol, they're, they're usually routing protocols that are used within an organisation or within a single, um, yeah, within a single organisation. Now that can be a service provider, it can be a enterprise, it can be you know, whatever you like, doesn't matter. But it's only interior, okay? It's only internal to that particular organisation. So it doesn't generally, you don't generally have these protocols talking to other organisations. An example of those are OSPF RIP. EIGOP, IGRP. Okay, and we'll look at a couple of those later on. <clears throat> as far as EGP is, EGP is concerned, Exterior Gateway Protocol, these are used basically for um, transferring um, and the dissemination of routing information between organisations, big organisations, normally talking service provider, and these are the, the routing protocols that basically make the, um, the internet run. There really is only one. Um, that's commonly used, and that's BGP. Uh, you won't have to do any BGP and CCNA. Uh, I've just got it in there as a you know, comparison point. Okay. So as we said, routing basics. A router will always choose the best route to a destination. The best route to a destination. Okay, so what does that mean? So as I said before, we look at prefix length, we look at metric within the routing protocol and we look at administrative distance which is the trustworthiness of a particular routing protocol because you can have routers where you might have three or four different dynamic routing protocols running at the same time and we'll have a look at that a little bit later on as we build our lab up. Um, but the most important thing to note is that the most explicit match always wins. So for instance um, if we if we just go down through the order, then we say right prefix length is the number of bits used to identify the network, um, and this is used to generally determine the most specific route. Okay, so a longer prefix length indicates a more specific route. For example, <clears throat> let's assume we're trying to reach host address of 10.1.5.2 slash 24. Okay, and so if you just bear with me a sec. I'll just give you an example of this, which is probably going to be nice and useful for you. Okay, so let's say we want to get to 10.1.5.2 slash 24. That's where our, that's our destination pack where we want to go. And in our routing table, we have matches, we have routes for 10.1.5.0 slash 24. And we have 10.0.0.0 slash 8. <coughs> okay, so what the basically the router will do, so basically in our router we have two routes for that equally match that network, okay, because remember if we're looking at our subnet mask, the slash 8 here indicates that, right, we don't care what the last three octets are, if you remember from last week in our IP addressing, all we're going to look at is that first octet, that slash 8 gives the mask, if you remember, 255.0.0, .0 .0, too many dots, 0.0.0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0, .0 and that basically says, all right, anything that's on the 10 network will match that address. So clearly that is on the 10 network, so it matches that route. However, that's not the end of the story, because as we said, it's the longest match, okay? So the longer the prefix is, so slash 24, the longer, the more specific the actual route is. 
So what the router does is it does a bit by bit comparison to find the most specific route that is the longest matching prefix. Since the 10.1.5.0/24 network is more specific, okay, because that's saying okay we're going to use a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0, that means that I want those three octets to match, but I don't care what that is. Well, clearly those three octets match, so this route here is a better match than this one here. So because it's more specific, this one's more specific. That route wherever it points, will be used regardless of any other metric or administrative distance that may be in the round table. Okay, so that one's always going to win, so it's always prefix length. That's the first one to win. Okay, so let's have a look at administrative distance versus metric. <clears throat> okay, so as I said, the admin distance is the relative trustworthiness of a routing protocol. Okay. So how much do I trust that the information that this routing protocol is putting in the routing table is actually accurate? That's what it's basically saying. The metric, on the other hand, is the best route to a destination within a routing protocol. So for instance, if you're running a dynamic routing, pro a dynamic routing protocol, um, OSP, or FEOGP, or whatever, they will get updates from multiple different neighbours, as we'll see in a minute. They could have multiple routes to a particular network. Okay. So all of those routes, as they come in, are, are assigned a, a metric. Now the metric can be a hop count, um, which it is in the case of RIP, so that's a distance vector protocol, so hop count, let's go in this distance, this many hops, so distance and the vector is how many hops. Um, and then other routing protocols like OSPF use cost. Okay, so this is a cost often based on the speed of the link over which the packet could particularly go. So in other words, a 10 meg link will have a higher cost than a 100 meg link. Okay, so because a 100 meg link has a lower cost, the route, that route, that particular route will be used. And we'll see that in more detail as we go along. Uh, I've got a question from Peter. Is admin distance effectively the same thing as a routing protocol priority? Um, I've not heard it called that, but that would be a good assimilation. Um, yeah, it's basically the trustworthiness of it. Um, and within, you'll see in the next couple of slides, there's a table with the values on it, and you'll basically see that yeah, it could effectively be called a priority. Okay, so common ADs, administrative distance, this is what I'm talking about. So you can see, <clears throat> um, connected routes. So what is a connected route? Well a connected route is a route that's that's straight on a um, the interface of the device in question. So for instance if we have two router, if we have a router with an interface that's in the 192.168.1 network then that 192.168.1 network will show up as a connected route. Okay. And again, we'll have a look at that more in detail as we get into our lab. So I want to try and skip through these slides reasonably quickly, and then we can have a look at the um, have a look at the, the actual routes on the table. Um, Peter D, can you give an example where the subnet mask length would be the same for two routes? Um, a little bit later on in the lab, you'll see that. But if you're talking about the subnet mask length, would be the same for two routes and generally what will happen is the router will use admin distance or hop count or whatever to actually only put one of those routes into the routing table unless you're deliberately trying to load balance and we'll, we'll see that a bit later on. So I'll keep that question in mind. That'll be answered later on. <coughs> okay, static um, has an administrative distance of one. So that's basically a route that you put into the router with the IP route command and we'll see that shortly. Um, an EIGIP summary route, five. Um, so that's a summarised route, so like a 10.000 slash 8 route through IGRP, external BGP, internal IGRP, blah, blah, blah. You can see all those distances there. What's that basically saying is that the lower the value, the more trustworthy I consider the route to be. That's what the route is going to look at. So it, it takes, it will take, an, a router will take an EIGRP summary route over an IGRP route or over an externally IGRP route. Uh, similarly, external BGP almost beats everything. 
So if you're connected to an ISP and you've got routes coming in, being distributed into your network via external BGP, then they will be assigned an administrative distance of 20. Okay, so that's why I want. Now, the ones you need to, you will, you will need to know some of these. Um, I would advise that you know, look, I would probably advise that you have a fairly good crack at memorising that entire table other than the one for ISIS. I'd be very surprised if you see anything on that. <coughs> this is a bit of a legacy table. Um, RIP, you, you've got to know that RIP is 120, IGRP is 100, OSPF definitely 110, internal IGRP 90 definitely, static and connect, connected definitely, um, and BGP, they would be the ones that I would definitely look at. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at a route table. So if we're on a real router, and we will be shortly, but I just want to have a look at this, and we do a show IP route, it gives us a bucket load of information. Okay, so first uh, first of all, you can see the network prefixes, 192.168.1.0 slash 24, is directly connected to Ethernet 0. Okay, directly connected means its administrative distance is 0. Okay, 150, so C and down here where we've got the C, 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 C and C, that means all these networks are directly connected. So this one's directly connected to loopback 1. This one here, 192.168.123, is directly connected to serial 0. 111.0 is directly connected to serial 1. And then we've got some routes here. We've got R, okay, that's a RIP route. <coughs> R for RIP, so that's coming by a RIP, and you can see it's a summary route, 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 here. Now notice the 121 here, the 120, the first number in the square brackets, that indicates the administrative distance of the protocol, so we know RIP is 120, okay? Then we've got the 1, that's a hop count, that's a metric. So the first number is the administrative distance, the second number is the actual hop count. And you can see that we've, we've learnt that RIP route from two neighbours. We've learnt it via 192.168.123.1 over serial 0, and we've learnt it from 192.168.111.2 over serial 1. Okay, and they're both showing the same metric. So both of those routes are currently in the route table. Lastly, we've got the S, okay, with a star. So the star indicates that that is the gateway of last resort. So as it says up here, gateway of last resort is 192.168.1.1 to network 0.0.0.0. So 0000 slash 0 basically means any network. Any network that's not matched by another route in the route table will always take this route here. So that's a default route. Now you can see S, you can see it's static for two reasons. One is that the S is there, S for static. One, the other one is that the administrative distance is 1. And we know from our previous table that static routes have an admin distance of 1. Now, Peter um, Urbanek has written in, are ADs fixed or can an admin redefine these values? No, Pete, they're, um, they're fixed values, so you can't change them. Okay, <coughs> so let's have a look at choosing the best route. So we want to reach the network 192.168.111.26 slash 24. So that's actually a host that we want to get to, but because we're using the slash 24 as our prefix length, effectively we're saying we want to get to 192.168.111. So if we look at our route table, we can see that there are two routes that match 192.168.111 slash 24. Okay, so there's 192.168.111.0 slash 24. Now, O. Okay, that means that been, that's been learned from OSPF. We also know that because the administrative distance here is 110 and we know from our table a little way back that that's the admin distance for OSPF. The cost or the metric, 58. Okay, and that's, out, that's heading out serial 3 the next hop address is 192.168.131.1. Okay, so that address there is not the address on this particular router that's seen this update. It's the address of the next hop. So who are we going to send the packet to? Okay, 
Then we also have the RIP route for 192.168.111.0 slash 24 here. Again, 120 admin distance to RIP, one hop count of one, and we're sending it out to 123.1 out serial zero. And then we've got a static route, which would also match because it's 192.168.0.0 slash 16, so it'll certainly match there. And we're going to send that by 10.1.1.1, admin distance of one, admin distance of one uh, cost of zero. Okay, it's a static route. So <clears throat> let me ask you guys a question. From the knowledge that you have so far, which uh, which route is it going to take? So which one are we going to look at? So we look at so if we go down the order and we look at prefix length first, we have two routes which uh, say slash twenty four. Okay, so two routes slash twenty four, so they are the longest closest match. We then look at metric. Okay, so the metric is this one here is fifty eight. The OSPF, this one here is for one, so there's a clear winner. Okay, there's a clear winner. So in this case, because the metric of RIP is lower, it would actually take the RIP route. Okay, it doesn't get to the point of going to the administrative distance because it's already matched. Prefix length, okay, there's two on that. How do I tie break? I go to the metric. Okay, it goes to the metric. RIP has a lower metric than OSPF, so in this case, it's going to take the RIP route. Okay, now this is this can be a little bit of a complication in routing if you've got two dynamic protocols like this, one using distance vector and one using cost, in that you don't know that the, you never know that the, the the route for RIP may actually be over a much slower or much more congested link. But you don't know that because you're only using hop count, whereas the OSPF um, route will take into account any metrics that are changed by the administrator or things like speed of the actual service. So it may actually be that the OSPF route is better, but just in the tie break situation here, it will take the rip, the rip route. Okay, not always the best, but you need to understand the basic underlying theory first before you worry about the network design features. Okay, so static routing versus dynamic routing. So static routing configured and maintained by an administrator, pretty straightforward. Um, can be time consuming. Why? Because if you've got a network with say 15, 20 routers, um, then every time you make a route change, you have to go and change every single one of those routers. Okay. And it can be a bit, well, potentially you would have to go and change every single one of those routers, which obviously takes time to go and log into each router, get into enable mode, make the changes to your routers, check it, is it okay, blah, blah, blah. Obviously as the route tables get bigger and you get more and more and more and more static routes, it then becomes difficult to manage. Dynamic routing, created and maintained by a routing protocol. Okay, so by EIGOP, by OSPF. Awesome. Um, and they look after everything. So yes, the administrator has to actually uh, configure the routing protocol for a start and plan it out. So there's a lot more planning. Well, so similar levels of planning involved, I guess. But yeah, there's a, there's more configuration to do. But once the configuration is done and you've tested it, you know it all works. Then any time a link goes down or a new network comes up, whatever the case may be, or a router dies or whatever happens, router reboots then all that will be taken in consideration by the routing protocol and the routing table will dynamically change nice and quickly and you don't have to worry about a thing. So much nicer, but you still need to understand the static routing. Okay, so pros. <coughs> Let's have a look at the pros and cons. So for static routing, pros are minimal CPU and memory overhead, okay, because everything's typed into um, configuration. There's no bandwidth overhead because there's no updates. Okay, there's no dynamic updates, so you don't need to use any of your bandwidth, you don't need to waste any of your bandwidth on routing updates. And of course, you have total control over how your packets are routed. Okay, now some might argue you have total control in the dynamic environment as well, but you know, it depends on who you integrate with. For instance, if you're using VGP, okay, and you're interfacing with a, a service provider, or you're a service, a service provider integrating with a customer or another service provider, 
then you don't have control over what they send you. Okay. Um, cons, course manual adjustments, as we said. <clears throat> There's no dynamic fault tolerance. Okay, so you have to statically put things in and massage in the costs okay, to get it to actually load balance or to fail over in the case of a, of a routing failure. Um, and look, as things get bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes impractical to actually use. Okay, um, just answering a question from Omar, uh, can you force, in the previous slide, can you force um, the router to take the OSPF route in, instead? No, you can't. Um, well, there are things you can do to say, yes, please take OSPF over RIP, but in that particular example with the two protocols working in defaults, no, you can't. It'll always take that. And uh, another one, uh, is RIP dynamic or static? Uh, RIP is a dynamic routing protocol. But don't worry too much about RIP. It's no longer on the CCMA exam. Okay, dynamic routing, <clears throat> pros and cons. So pros, simpler configuration for larger networks. Okay, so if you've got a really big enterprise or a service provider network, it becomes much easier to manage it and the configuration is much less using a dynamic routing protocol than what it would be if you're using static routes everywhere. Okay, simple as that, really. Um, dynamic fault tolerance and new paths. So as you bring new networks on, they'll order, you just need to put in a, in a statement into the routing protocol to say, okay, now advertise this network, bang, off it goes. It's in. And you don't have to update that on all your routers. It just, away it goes, passes it right across. And of course, you can do dynamic load balancing. Okay, so there was a question early on that sort of alluded to that a little bit. Um, if you have two routes that are identical and they go out different interfaces and everything's identical, same routing protocol, same metric, same everything, then some protocols will actually dynamically load, ba load balance, which is fantastic. Okay, cons of course are that there's bandwidth usage for updates. Okay, so you're going to waste a little bit of bandwidth for your updates. Um, with some protocols that's not an issue. Okay, and you'll see with the protocols we're now looking at for uh, the CCNA, that's not really an issue and we'll see why shortly. CPU and memory load can be a problem, particularly if you have very large routing tables, um, because uh, the more that the, rat, the more routing and topology tables that the routing protocol has to put into memory, the less memory and CPU cycles you have for doing other stuff. Um, which is why you often see this uh, Cisco three-layer architecture of building networks, you know, with your core layer, which does all your routing, um, your distribution layer, which does a lot of the VLANing, and then you've got your access layer when you plug in all your ports. Um, and of course, the cons are the routing protocol decides the best route. Now, you know, that, that's not necessarily such a bad thing. It, I mean, it's generally a good thing, provided, obviously, that you, uh, that, the routing, that the dynamic routing protocol is actually set up correctly. If things go a little bit terrible, then, you know, you, you can be in a fair bit of trouble. Things can get out of hand pretty quickly. But if you know what you're doing, dynamic routing protocol, letting it decide what route to take is not a bad thing. Okay, so types of dynamic routing. <clears throat> so there's distance vector, which as I said before is based on a distance, which is the metric, hop count in this case, and the vector is the direction. Okay, so in examples of that, uh, examples of protocols that use distance vector are RIP, both version 1 and version 2, and sort of IGRP. IGRP is a Cisco is a Cisco proprietary protocol. Okay, it stands for um, Interior Gateway Routing Protocol. Now it sort of uses distance vector, but there's a couple of, there, there's a couple of little link state sort of things in there as well. So it's almost a hybrid, as with its older brother. Um, link state. Okay, so what they do is is they monitor the states of links. Okay, so physical interfaces. That's what they monitor, and they send updates out about that. Okay, so they don't care about hop count, they care about the state of the actual link that you want to send the packet across, and that's where this cost comes into it, we'll see that a bit later on. Um, ISIS, which is Intermediate System to Intermediate System, um, legacy protocol, not used hugely anymore, um, that's a link state as well. And then I said, and then there's a hybrid, um, 
Okay, did I say two types of dynamic routing? Really sort of three. Hybrid is um, EIGRP, which again is a Cisco proprietary <coughs> protocol, and it uses a number of metrics in combination to create a cost, if that makes sense. And we'll see a bit later on how that all works. Now, I'll just ask a, answer a couple of questions while I've got them here. Um, do all pro routing protocols live entirely in layer three? Um, yes. Yes is a safe answer. Um, yeah, yes. Yes is the only answer we really need to sort of discuss in any depth at the moment. So, um, routing protocols live at layer three. Without layer three routers, you, you don't have layer three um, routing. Um, and uh, second question, PDD, does all this apply to both IPv4 and IPv6? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all exactly the same. Okay, distance vector characteristics. <clears throat> so hold on to your hat. There's a fair bit to get through here. So distance vector routers have periodic updates, okay, where they actually broadcast the entire routing table. So everything they have in their routing table will go bingo to every single connected router, okay, that's participating um, in the in the routing protocol. So if you've got ten routers that are all doing RIP, every every thirty seconds, okay, for RIP, every thirty seconds, all of those routing, all those routing tables will be disseminated backwards and forwards across your entire network. Okay, so you can imagine what sort of traffic that would generate. Um, so the updates are thirty seconds for RIP, every ninety seconds for IGRP. Okay, now just another question. Uh, when I say cost, you mean money, time, etc. No, no, no. When I say cost, I mean the actual cost of getting the route through the router, and it's generally to do with some characteristics of the speed of the link. So, for instance, it may be, um, it could be just the speed of the link, or it could be uh, the speed of the link combined with. Uh, the delay of the link combined with the congestion level of the link, so on and so forth, and we'll see that a little bit more as we get further on. Um, and why is RIP no longer in the Cisco exam? Um, you would have to ask Cisco that, but uh, generally they usually take things out when they deem them to be legacy and no longer substantial in deployment. Okay, <clears throat> getting back to the characteristics. Okay, so. Um, distance vector protocols are also slow to converge. Now the reason they're slow to converge is that get that out of the, way. the reason they're slow to converge is because they have this concept of hold timers, okay, and dead timers. So what that basically means is that every 30 seconds, your your routing in the case of RIP will send out a an update. Now, if for some reason, um, if for some reason, the a router uh, goes offline or a link goes down or something, and a particular router doesn't receive an update from its neighbour, it will generally, with most routing protocols, wait three times the update timer. So in this case, for RIP, every thirty seconds. So um, that will rate, that will wait. 90 seconds before it does anything. Okay, so it'll just sit there and sit there and listen. Is there an update coming? Is there an update coming? Is there an update coming? Okay, no, there's not an update coming. Okay, holy cow, what do I have to do? Then the routers start looking at their route table and saying, okay, uh, this neighbor's down. Um, I need to take that route out of my routing table because that neighbor's no longer there. That route can no longer exist. And it pulls the routing, it pulls that entry out of the routing table. Okay? As you can see, that takes time. Okay? That takes time for that to happen. So first of all, they will wait. It will wait that 90 seconds before um, it does anything. And then after that, it waits further amount of time, so the dead timer, before it actually removes the route. So it can be with RIP, it can be anywhere up to close to five minutes before a dead route will be removed from the routing table. Okay? So you can see that takes a long time to converge, a long time. Uh, they're also susceptible to routing loops, and again, this is because of this update. 
okay, these slow updates. Okay, so one interface goes down, another one comes up, okay, I've got a route that's just come in on my, because when they send a routing update, a router sends a routing update, <coughs> all the routers will automatically update their routing tables, but it still takes time for a dead route to be removed. So there's the potential for you to introduce a new route on one interface, take the old route off the other one, and then all of a sudden you've got this update comes in, the routing table updates, and now it's got two routes, or well, hang on, which, which, which way do I go, which way do I go? Okay, so you're in trouble. Um, and some form of distance is used to calculate the metrics. So usually it's a hop count with distance vector protocols. Usually just typically just a hop count. Okay, so and they're usually limited. So RIP, for instance, um, has a hop count limitation of 15. So if there's any more than 15 hops between you and the network you want to send to, RIP just says, <laughs> no, bad luck. Doesn't send at all. Okay. Um, and lastly, the Bellman Ford algorithm is typically used. Okay, so it's just a, a different type of, just a certain type of um, algorithm that's used to work out which is the best route. Okay, so link state characteristics. These are a little different. Okay, so I'll just answer a question from Edward. Uh, No, you're not going to see um, IG, yeah, okay, so he's just asked about whether we see IGRP or EIGRP on non-Cisco routers. No, you won't. They're only available on Cisco routers. They are Cisco proprietary only. Okay. Okay. So let's have a look at the link state characteristics. First of all, there's, um, they keep a number of tables, okay? They keep a neighbor table, so they have to keep a listing of how many neighbors they've got, how they're connected, and what updates are coming from, what updates are coming from those neighbors. It then from that builds a topology table, and we'll have a look at, again, what that is shortly. But it's basically a, basically a, a map of what the network looks like in terms of the neighbor relationships. And it also has the shortest path table, otherwise known as the route table. Um, in the case of link state, the Dijkstra algorithm is usually used for creating the, the routing table. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. Next section. So classful and classless routing. So what we mean here is that classful routing protocols don't use subnet mask information. Okay, so they don't send the mask out information out with the routing updates. So a router running a classful routing protocol will react in one of two ways when it receives a route. If the router has a directly connected interface belonging to the same major network, okay, so in this case, if we look at the example 10.4.1.0 and 10.4.6.0 belong to the same major network, so if it gets route updates for those two uh, networks and both belong to the same major interface, it will apply, in that case, it will apply the same subnet mask as that interface. So if we receive updates for those networks and we've got um, an IP address on that particular interface, which is 10.4, uh, 10.6.1.8, then we use whatever subnet mask is on that particular interface and we apply it to those routing updates. Okay, if that makes sense. So. <coughs> Because we don't have a subnet mask coming in with that routing update, we have to use something to determine where our host packets go. Okay, we have to use something. So we just apply the subnet mask that exists on that particular interface if the routing update and the interface share the same major network. Okay. If, however, the router does not have any interface belonging to the same major network, it will apply a classful subnet mask to the route, okay? The classful subnet mask to the route. So in this case, if we have 10.4.1.45 and we have 11.3.4.3, they don't belong to the same major network, okay? So in this case, the router would just apply a slash 8 because a slash 8 for the 10 network is the default classful subnet, okay? If that makes sense? Okay, so we'll look at this more detail here. <clears throat> so router B 
sends an update with a subnet mask for 10.2.0.0. Okay, sorry, without subnet mask for 10.2.0.0. If router A, if his directly connected interface has the IP address of 10.4.0.1 slash 16, it will apply the same subnet mask slash 16 to the 10.2.0.0 update from router B. Okay, so router B sends an update for this network across to here. <clears throat> he says, all right, my IP address is 10.4.0.1 slash 16. I will apply that same subnet mask to that update. If, however, router A's directly connected interface has an IP address of the 10 network, just 10. Dot, that, that, that's outside of the 10 network, so it could be a 12, 11, it could be a 127, could be a, it won't be a 127, could be a 1, um, 192, could be 203, whatever it is. It will simply apply a slash 8 subnet mask to the 10.2.0.0 update from router B. Okay, so that's all of it. Okay, classless protocols, however, do send the subnet mask in the update. So VLSM, variable length subnet masks, are permitted and they're encouraged. Okay, so that basically means you can make your subnet mask whatever, whatever you want to be. Um, whatever the case is, that classless protocol will send along that information. So examples of class full protocols, so ones that do not send subnet masks in the updates, you've got RIP version 1 and IGRP. Class less, you've got RIP version 2, EIGRP, OSPF as the internal gateway protocols and obviously BGP will also send it if you configure it so. <coughs> Okay, static routing. Okay, so let's have a look at a static routing lab. Okay, just a question from Bernie. Um, when you say directly connected interface on router A, do you mean the interface on a path from router B to router B A or any interface on router A? Um, any interface. So it won't matter what it is, it's in the interface. Okay, another question. Is the term CIDR still commonly used? Uh, yes. Yep. Okay, so if we have a look, and I'm just going to go into <coughs> one of these labs here. Okay, so these are the Cisco Learning Labs, which uh, again I, I recommend um, if you want good hands-on hands guided um, step through, have a look at this. Okay, so this is a particular lab about uh, performing initial router setup. Now I'm not actually going to use it like that, I'm just going to use it to demonstrate some static routing. Okay, so change, turn both my routers up. Okay, go into enable mode, you'll notice the prompt changes. Okay, now if I use, just want to show you the current setup. Uh, okay, let's make that a bit bigger. So you can see that better. And we'll put this one down here. Lovely. So if I look at that again, show IP in brief. So all our interfaces are down. Show IP in brief. So this guy's got Ethernet 00, zero um, up <coughs> and an IP address on here. Now if we look across at the diagram over here on our right hand side, that's what we're working with. So you can see router 1 up the top and core router down the bottom are connected by the E0 slash 0 interface. Now while I'm talking, um, see if you can answer what, what sort of cable connection would that have to be being a direct router to router connection. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to have a look at the run. Um, and we can see that on Ethernet 00, the core router's got the IP address 10.2.2.254 with a slash 24 mask. Okay, we have a winner, Dave Bessel. Correct, crossover cable. Thank you. Okay. Um, and over here on router 1, we don't currently have an, an IP address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an IP address on Ethernet 00, which is in the same network. So we're going to go int e0 slash 0, the address 10.2.2.0.0, .2 .2 .0 .0. Uh, 
to make a 253, so just the next step down. Same network mask, and then we're going to no shut it. <clears throat> okay, so no shut or the correct full term, no shut down. <coughs> okay, so that now come up. So now, if I do a show IP int brief, okay, we can see that's up. So by rights, so I should be able to ping across to the other router. Bingo, there we go. Done. So now I can connect across to that. Now if I have a look at the route table, currently you can see I've got, uh, there's a number of important things here. Um, there's obviously information, so you read through that, look at your codes. Gateway of last resort is not set. Okay, gateway of last resort is not set. It means we don't have a default gateway at this stage. We can't route anywhere. Okay, it's saying that we have 10.0 to 0 .0 slash 8 is variably subnetted. I have two subnets and two masks. What are you talking about? It's only got one IP address. Yep. Okay, well, it considers the 10.2.2.0 slash 24 as one network directly connected. And then you've got the 10.2.2.253 slash 32, which is the actual host route. So that's where it gets those two subnets, two masks from. Okay, you'll notice also that this one is designated by an L, which means it's just a local IP address. It's locally connected to that particular route. And if you look at the route table here, we see the same thing. Okay, so there's nothing there. So what I'm going to do is, on here, I'm going to create another interface. A loopback zero. Okay, now loopbacks are often used to tie routing protocols to. Um, or to tie tunnels to, or to tie, you know, all sorts of things to. And the reason is because loopbacks never go down, okay? If you've got a loopback and it goes down, then, uh, yeah, you're in a fair bit of trouble. Basically, that wouldn't happen unless there's a major error with the router. So, okay, so on this loopback, I'm going to put the address 1.1.1.1 slash 32. Okay, done. So if I look at my, now <clears throat> we see we've got 1 to 1 to 1 to 1. Now, if I go back to router 1 and do show IP route, it's not there, okay? If I try to ping 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, nothing is going to happen. Why? Because there is no route, okay? There is no route there, and there is no gateway of last resort. So it doesn't know where to send it. It's got no idea. And so let's change that. Okay, so we go into configuration mode and type in IP route 1.1.1.1. One 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 one. Okay, we're going to make this a host route. Now it's a host, why is it a host route? It's a host route because I'm using all 32 bits of the subnet mask to say this is the route I'm talking about. Okay, I want this specific route in. I could also do it like this. Okay, that would also be valid. It's just a less specific route. That would just then say that anything that's destined for 1.1.1.x would take this route. But in this case, at the moment, because I want it to be a host route, I'll put all 32 routes in. Then, the next thing I need to do is if we use a question mark, <coughs> that says to us, Okay, what's next? Well, the next thing is, right, which, what is the next hop? Where, does it have, where do I have to send this route? That's all good. I've got IP route, this network with this mask, where am I going to send it to? Now, you can see here, you can send it out physical interfaces, um, logical interfaces. You can send it to a loopback. You can send it to null, which means just put it in a black bit bucket and kill it. Um, or you can send it to a.b.c.d, which is the next host, and that's where I'm going to send it to. 10.2.2.254 okay so if I go show up right now I can see whoa look at that here we go it's there so we've got a static route 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 admin distance of 1 okay 0 by 10.2.2.254 so now if I ping 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 
thing you know, we've now got routing happening. Okay, so that's what the static routes are. That's how you do static routes. So if we just quickly, I'll put in a loopback zero on here as well, and we'll put its IP address as 2.2.2.2. Again, we'll make it a hosty. Hosty with the mosty. <clears throat> Look at the route table. There it is, we can see it's connected. Look at the route table on here. No, no good, can't get to it. So we have to put in the static route, IP like route. That's where I'm going to send it to my next host. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Rats now in there. If I ping. <coughs> Bingo. So that's my static routing. Okay, nice and simple. Nice and easy. Okay, but again, there's no gateway of last result just yet. So it's all just done by static route. So you can imagine any time I added interfaces to router 1 or I added networks on the opposite side, so not on over here, if I added networks on the opposite side of router 1, I would have to put routes in the core router to say, please go to router 1 before you get to those networks. Okay? Yeah. Okay, a couple of questions. Um, Cisco Online Lab are freely available to everyone. Um, no, it's not. Uh, the Cisco Online Lab is a paid service. Okay, The reason they're advantageous, particularly for CCNA level, if you haven't had a lot of experience, is uh, simply because they have uh, guided step-by-step -step lab processes that you can go through that, that really give you um, exactly what you need to know for the CCNA exam. Um, and does Cisco support the Slash 24? Absolutely. Absolutely. They, they support any subnet link um, you want to put in. That's valid, <coughs> any valid subnet link. So you can't put in something crazy. You can't have two different subnets on connected interfaces. You can, but it won't work. But uh, yeah, pretty much anything. Okay, um, another question. What's the difference between a local and connected for a route? Um, you'll see the connected route actually refers to the, the actual network itself. Okay, now see how it says here 2.2.2.2 is connected, whereas this one it says 10.2.2.0 is connected. The difference in that is because of the subnet mask. The slash 24, so that's a connected part of it there, with the slash 32, that's a connected part of it there. So the connected refers to the network that's connected, and that's based on the subnet mask as well, whereas the local address actually refers to the, the actual address that is on the interface. Now in this case here, because I'm using a slash 32, it's one in the same. So it doesn't, it, it says, okay, you've only got one subnet, that's fine. Whereas the 10 network, because I have, I'm using a slash 24 network mask, this part is a connected network, this part is the local IP address. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Oh, James, okay, does it support the slash 24 instead of two? Um, yes, you can put the slash 24 in. Depends on the iOS. Now, I get, sorry, James, I've got to check now. Um, <clears throat> so what James is asking is, can you put in slash 24 instead of 255.255.255.0? Um, yes, you can, uh, but it depends on the iOS version. So whether these particular ones can or not, I'm not sure. So let's have a look. No, no, these ones don't. But um, <clears throat> yes, you can. Again, it depends on iOS version. So if you look at this, what version we're running here. Okay, so it's running 15, well, it's running 15.2 on the Solaris. So you can see it's a Solaris box running 15.2. Um, but with this particular feature set, that command isn't available. The slash 24, but uh, yes, it is available, particularly on the 7600s or the bigger routers you can put the slash 24s in for your routes, absolutely. You can use slash notation. Okay, so if we go back to our... Um, back, okay, that's all right. 
Okay, so that's a static routing. So as you can see, fairly much, fairly straightforward. So I'll just go back to our EIGRP now. So EIGRP is enhanced interior gateway protocol. As I said before, it's Cisco proprietary. It is a hybrid protocol, so it has both distance vector and link state um, features. It uses uh, the dual algorithm. Um, you only need to know that in terms of that it uses a dual algorithm and not how the actual algorithm works um, because it's extremely complex. It forms neighbor relationships okay, with all directly connected routers that are participating in EIGRP. It uses a concept of autonomous systems. So that basically means that each EIGRP router can only run a single autonomous system. Um, and this it basically the autonomous system basically equates to an administrative domain. Okay. Um, it can use unicast or multicast for updates. So I'm not talking about how it, how the router actually passes packets. I'm just saying it uses multicast um, or unicast for the updates. It uses the reliable transport protocol RTP to ensure the delivery of your EIGRP packets backwards and forwards. And EIGRP does not send periodic full table routing updates. So updates are only sent when a change occurs <coughs> and, and includes only the particular change. So if, for example, you've got 50 routes in your routing table um, and one of your interfaces drops off and dies or is disconnected or something, in the update, it will only send the update related to that interface. Okay, it won't send the whole routing table. So you can tell already that it uses a lot less bandwidth than those routing protocols that send out everything. Um, and EIGRP is a classless protocol, um, so it supports VLSM. Okay, so EIGRP also supports multiple protocols, which isn't such a big deal anymore, but it will support IP. IPX and Apple Talk Routing. Now, EIGRP, for the purposes of the CCNA exam, does not support IPv6. Okay, so if there's any EIGRP questions, I mean, no, it's unlikely that they're going to try and trick you, but if there's any EIGRP questions in there um, related to IPv6, that, those answers are invalid. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't work with uh, IPv6. <coughs> so EIGRP has an AD or admin distance of 90 for routes that originate within the autonomous system. Okay, so if you've got four routers and they're all in the same autonomous system, then the administrative distance for all those routes will be 90. If, on the other hand, you are connecting with routers that are in a different autonomous system, controlled by someone else, or just a different administrative domain within your network, then those routes coming in from there will be marked with the admin distance of 170. Okay, so they are less trustworthy. Um, EIGRP uses bandwidth and delay to calculate its metric by default. Okay. It also supports three other parameters, reliability, load and the MTU size. However, by default, it only uses bandwidth and delay. <coughs> um, these five things, five metrics together, or parameters together, are known as the K values, K1, K2, K3, K4, K5. And there is a rather complex formula, which I don't know, which I won't go into, um, which determines how it comes up with the overall metric. It's suffice to say, it's only the bandwidth. The reason they only use bandwidth and delay is because if you use the other three, and you can, you can administratively change those if you like, the, the actual calculation becomes very complex and it uses more CPU and memory than, than you really want to use. And it becomes very, very difficult to actually manage. Um, <clears throat> moving on, uh, it also has a maximum hop count of 224, so much better than, than RIPS 16. Um, although the default hop count is set to 100. But still, 100, 100 hop count, wow, you know, that'll get you a long way. If you've got a network that's that's uh, bigger than 100 hop counts, I'd be extremely surprised. <coughs> okay, it builds three tables. A neighbor table, which lists all the neighboring routers. 
and each of those nobles must be in the same autonomous system. Okay. Um, it also builds a topology table, which is a list of all the routes in the autonomous system, irrespective of their administrative distance or their value or their metric or whatever. It contains every single route, so it's every possible route. So it's like looking at a roadmap, it's every possible route. Then the routing table contains only the very best route for each known network. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, that's all it contains. So neighbor relationships, okay, they form neighbor relationships, these are called adjacencies with other routers only in the same autonomous system and they do this by um, the exchange of hello packets, okay. And it's only after one set of adjacency is formed that they can share routing information. Until they form that adjacency they can't share any information. In EIGRP exchange hellos are sent on the multicast address 224.0.0.10. Um, by default on LAN, so broadcast or high speed WAN interfaces, um, EIGFP hellos are sent every 5 seconds. On slower links they are sent every 60 seconds. Okay? And you can change that on a per interface basis if you want. So you can manage that if you want to. Okay, in addition to a hello timer, EIGRP neighbours are also stamped with a hold timer, so seri uh, similar to RIP. Okay, now the hold in that, that hold time indicates how long the router should wait before it says, "Okay, my neighbour's no longer there; it's dead." If it stops receiving hello packets from that neighbour, so every now and then you may get, you know, one where you you might miss one packet, but then it comes back the next. That's okay because you get those fluctuations in interfaces. Things will go up, things will go down, things will bounce just briefly. That's okay. We don't want our routing protocol to panic and send updates every time it sees a bounce on the interface. I mean, if you've got a dodgy cable or something like that, that's for the most part up, but then it's going down every now and then, you can see a lot of changes in the routing table very quickly and that can cause instability within the network. So that's the idea of why these hello timers are there, uh, hold times are there. So as I said before, by default, the hold timer is three times a hello timer. So on a high speed link um, for EOGP, that means that time is set to 15 seconds. And on the slow WAN links, it's set to 180, so three minutes. Okay, now interestingly, with EIGRP, it's a bit of a catcher, is that when you change a hello timer, so how often it sends out uh, hello packets, that doesn't automatically change the whole timer. Okay? So you need to update both. Or, better, don't alter either of them, just leave them. Okay? Cisco have got them into default for a reason. Um, Changing the hello timer, oh sorry, I'm reading my notes and I've just said the same thing. So the other thing I want to say was that the, the whole time, hello and hold timers don't have to match between the routers for the relationship to form. Okay, so you can have a hello timer of 5 seconds on one side and 10 seconds on the other side and that's okay. Okay, they will match. Same with the hold times. You can have different hold times. It doesn't care, and you'll see how that's very different to OSPF later on. Okay, but it's an important distinction to make because okay? you don't want to get tripped up on that if you're sending XAN personally. So the hello and hold times don't need to match between routers for EIGRP to be happy. Okay, so neighbor table. So how do we construct it? Okay, so neighbor table is constructed or formed from the information within hello pack. And these contain the IP address of the neighbouring router, so whoever sent it the hello packet, the local interface that received the neighbour's hello packet, the whole time of value, which is interesting because it doesn't care about it, and a sequence number which indicates the order in which the neighbours were moved. Okay. Now, the values must match for an adjacency to form in terms of your secret numbers and the IP address. When you put in your neighbours you'll see, we'll see how we all configure this, um, the whole timer and the hello timers don't have to match, which is strange, but everything else must match. Okay, And the autonomous system numbers must match. If the autonomous system numbers don't match in particular, you won't get anything happening. They'll just sit there and just broadcast, multicast to each other all day long, but nothing will happen. The other thing to note is that adjacencies won't form 
unless you're using the primary IP, to, IP address on your interface and the subnet masks on both side nodes. So you can't have a slash 8 on one side and a slash 16 on the other. Even though from a point to point that may work, from a routing protocol perspective that can't work. And you also can't use secondary addresses. Okay. So our topology table. So once the IGRP forms its adjacencies, the routers will begin to share their routing information. Okay? So each router's updates contains a list of all the routes that it knows about and the respective metrics for those routes. Then all of those routes are added to the EIGRP topology table. Then the route with the lowest metric to each network will become what's called the feasible distance, okay, or the FD. And then that feasible distance for its network will be the route that's installed in the routing table. <coughs> So the feasible distance is derived from the advertised distance of the router sending the updates, the one that sends the update, okay, and the local router's metric to that advertising route. So I agree that's that's a little bit confusing, so let's have a look at the example. Okay. So here we go, if we look at router A, <coughs> excuse my voice. So if we look at router A, we see that it has three separate paths to the destination network on the right. So I can go through router B, C or D. If we add up the metrics on that diagram of form of distance, we can see that going router B's feasible distance to the destination network is 8. Okay, because we're looking at 2 and 6. It's 8. Okay, so we're looking at the feasible distance. So it doesn't include at this stage this metric to get from router A to router B. So the feasible distance that's coming into router A from router B is 2 plus 6, which is 8. If we look at router C, the feasible distance coming in from router C to router A is 14 plus 9. Okay, so it's 23. And the feasible distance coming from router D into router A is 5 plus 4, so that's 9. So router A, if let's say router B sent its update to A, it will provide an advertised distance of 8 to the destination network. Router C will provide an advertised distance of 23 and Router D an advertised distance of 9. Then Router A calculates the total distance to the destination network by adding that admin distance to its own distance to reach that advertised route. Okay, so for instance um, if the metric from through router B will be 6 plus 2 which is 8 plus 8 will be 16. Okay, if we go through router C it will be 9 plus 14 is 23 plus 4 is 27. Um, and the router D 4 plus 5 is 9 plus 2 is 11. Okay, so thus, the route through router D, which is a total metric in this count of 11, would become the feasible distance for router A, and is added to the routing table as the best route. Okay, so it calls this route a successor. Okay, if that link fails, EIGRP includes the backup routes, so these other routes through C and B, into the topology table, okay, and if that route to router D disappears, so if this link dies here, or that router dies there, then the next less expensive feasible distance will pop into the router, to, router, um, router table. Okay? So when it, those routes that it includes in the topology table, but not in the route table, are called the feasible successors. So the best route is called the successor. The next best route is called the feasible successor and only exists in the topology table. Okay, so the route will only become a successor if its advertised distance is less than the current feasible distance. Okay, so if you learn a new route, new route comes in, if its feasible distance is less than the current feasible distance, then it will bang, pop in. Okay, so I hope that made that a little bit clearer, but it is confusing.
Okay, so I just missed a couple of questions here. I'll go back. Um, if router G fails, okay, then that will change. So one question is, what happens if router G fails, or same router F or router E or router H, any downstream neighbour? If any downstream neighbour changes, then what will happen is, let's say if router G fails, if router G fails, its route will stop being advertised to router D. Router D will see that and stop advertising that route through to router A. So then it's removed from router A anyway, and the next best route, which in this case would be route through router B, it's the next lowest value, would be taken from the topology table as a feasible successor and placed into the route table as the best successor. Okay? Okay, so moving on. So EIGRP uses five different types of packet types. Um, there's a hello packet, which is multicast, an update packet, which can be unicast or multicast, a query packet, which is multicast, a reply packet, which is unicast, or an acknowledgement packet, which is unicast as well. So I'll get through these pretty quickly. You don't need to know a lot about these, but they're worthwhile just understanding. So a hello packet used to form neighbor relationships and we're explained. We sort of talked about those a bit earlier. Um, they're always to the multicast address 224.0.0.10. Ah. Update packets are sent between neighbors to build the topology and routing tables. Okay, so this is updates are only sent to new neighbors, as uh, sent to new neighbors as, multi, as unicasts. However, if a route's metric is changed or an update goes down or something like that, the update will be sent out as a multicast address. Okay, so it's only new neighbors that get the update packets as unicasts. Existing neighbors get it as multicast. <coughs> uh, query packets are sent by a router when a successor route fails. So going back to the question about if router G fails, the successor route, the best route would fail. And if there are no feasible successes in the topology table, so if it's the only route it's got, there's nothing in the topology table, the router will then place that route in what's called an active state, and, which sounds crazy, but active state mostly means it's not available, and it queries its neighbours for an alternative route. So it just says, hey, if it, I've lost this route, if anyone else, does anyone else know a route for this network? Okay, and again, they're sent via multicast. So reply packets, they're sent as a response to the query packets, um, assuming that the responding router has an alternative route. Okay? And they're sent, they're actually sent as unicast because you don't want to send it as multicast, you only want to send it back to the router that actually asked for it. So that's why they're sent back as unicast. So remember later, earlier on we were talking about um, EIGRP used RTP to ensure reliable delivery. Um, delivery is guaranteed by using acknowledgements. Okay? Um, so again, this is you know, a typical TC, like a, a TCP acknowledgement. So hello packets are sent with no data other than an acknowledgement number. Acknowledgements are always sent as unicasts. Okay, so the following um, packet types, updates, queries and replies, employ RTP to ensure viable, reliable delivery via the acknowledgement. Okay, so EIGRP route state. So you can exist in two route states, okay? So working and not working. No, no, that's a joke. Little joke. Okay, stop laughing. Um, <clears throat> seriously, they can be an active or passive. Okay, so a passive state, first of all, indicates that a route is reachable and that EIGRP is fully converged. <coughs> so it's talking about it from an EIGRP point of view. It's passive because I know about that route and I know it works. So I'm not going to, I'm not actively trying to listen to updates or query anyone as to where that network is. I know where it is, so it's in a passive state. Um, as we said before, a router is placed, a route is placed in an active state if the successor fails and there are no feasible successes or both the successor and feasible successes all fail, which then forces the router to send out query packets and to try to reconvert. Okay, if you have multiple routes in an active state, this would indicate that your EIGRP network is you know, pretty unstable and things are going pretty wrong. If in your topology table there exists 
a feasible, at least one feasible successor, then you should never see a route in an active state. Okay? Routes in RIGP will only ever be in an active state if it's got, it doesn't know where to go. Now, one of the great problems of EIGRP is what's called stuck inactive. Okay? And that basically when a router sends out a query packet, but it doesn't receive any reply within three minutes. In other words, it can't reconverge. This route is just stuck inactive. I don't know where to go. I've got it here, but I, I know it doesn't work. I don't know where to go. <coughs> okay, metrics again uses two by default, but has five. So it has bandwidth, load, delay, reliability, and MTU, but it uses bandwidth and delay by default. Okay, so again, this is the same as IGRP, except that EIGRP is a bit more granular, um, and it, inside its formula, um, which is, oh, no, I'm not going to go into the formula, it's crazy. Um, but suffice to say, EIGRP um, is a little more granular in its use, uh, used in its formula for developing its metric um, than what I, IG, IGRP is. Okay, let's have a look at, let's go back to our lab and have a little, little bit of a look at some EIGRP routing. Now, for the purposes of the exam, we only need to worry about single area configuration um, and there'll be maybe some auto summary, some load balancing and some basic troubleshooting we're just going to have a quick look at before we go on to OSPF. We have a look at our, just to re-familiarise ourselves with our lab, and our route table. So what we've effectively got <coughs> is two routers with a link between them on the same subnet, and then a loop back on either router, which is acting as a remote network. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at my routes and I'm going to remove these static routes. Okay. So now I can no longer see the one at one at one network and I can no longer ping. Similarly here. Oops. I no longer have access to those networks. So let's configure the LGRP. Okay. So if we just have a look at our router, we, uh, we can see <coughs> there's a number of different... Um, oh, there's ISIS. You wouldn't believe it, would you? Um, now it's interesting, that, it's interesting that ISIS is still there. But anyway, so these are the different routing protocols that this particular um, iOS is capable of working with. And you can see um, the EIGRP there, so we're going to use EIGRP. Um, and the next thing we need to put in is this concept of our autonomous system number. Okay, so in this case we're going to use AS10. Now we go into configure animal. Now what networks do we wish to advertise? Okay, so we want to go Network, uh, let's go, now this will be interesting, have a look at just what we do here, zero, network 10.2.2.0, because I know there's a slash 24 on that on that ethernet address, so let's um, change the 10.2.2.0, and we also want to go 1.1.1.1, one, 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 one. advertise both over there, and that's it, that's all we need to do, to, uh, to configure bog standard EIGRP. Okay, we've got to have an autonomous system number and we have to put in network statements. <coughs> now the interesting thing is, from a routing, from, from a technical routing perspective, the network command does not mean please advertise this network in EIGRP. What it actually means is 
please use the interface that matches any interface that matches this network address and participate in the IGRP routing. Okay. So if we had 10 interfaces in the 10.2.2 network, then 10 interfaces would participate in the IGRP, if that makes sense. Okay. So it's not saying advertise this network in the IGRP, it's saying any interface in this network please participate in the IGRP. Okay, so very important point to remember. Now, something interesting may have happened. And again, it depends on the iOS version, but let's have a look. I'll have a look at the show run. Let me get that in. Whoa, hang on a minute. Look at this. EIGRP has said network 1.000 and network 10.0.0.0. Okay. So it's put in, it's it just decided to use the class for masks. Okay. So that's a trick. That's a trick with EIGRP that you have to be cognizant of. Now by default, it will do that. Okay. So it doesn't summarize, oh, so sorry, it summarizes by default. Okay. So if we go up to here, and let's configure our IGRP. Now, oh, in configuration, maybe twit. Okay, IGRP 10. And we go network 10.2.2.0. And network 2.2.2.2. And you can see already it says neighbor exchange up new adjacency form. So if I go do show IP route. Okay, we can see we've got a route D just coming in. So D is from EIGRP. So we've got a EIGRP running. Right. Okay, done. Now, that seems reasonably straight poor. Now, I'll show you why the auto summary is a, is a problem. We go into int loopback on. And we go IP address, um, let's say we call it uh, 112 at 168. Uh, let's call it um, 172. Ah. 172 okay, we'll put it in there. And then we go into router EIDRP 10 and we go network 172.16.1.0. Actually, I think we see how it's put in now, even though I've said 172.16.1.1. It's actually put in network 172.16.0.0. Okay. And just to actually just to make that a little different, we'll change that network mask to a class C. Going around the to P10 and check this out. If I type on network 172.16.1.0. Then we have a little run. Once it's done, it hasn't changed. See, it doesn't care. It just says, "All right, now I know the the, the class for mask for that is 172.16 slash 8, so that's what I'm going to put in." Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. If we go across here and in my loopback one here, I go IP. I go IP address 172.16.1.2 and like that. Okay, and I give it that IP address, which you can see is in the same slash 24 network, or even if I don't, even if I just say 255. Okay, different slash, it's a different network altogether, it's a host network, okay. And now that we have the 10, 
and I go one and two and take dot one dot two. You'll see again, good old EIGFP. Put it in there. Okay. So by rights, I should be able to ping EIGFP should advertise those. Okay. And you'll see 16 is there. Okay, so it's submitted, it's local. Okay, I've got an address on on the two. Ah, I'm not done on my previous day. sorry guys. I go back there. Should put a zero on there. Okay, so it's going to advertise those routes. So if I do that, you'll see that now the routes changed. Okay, see how that routes changed? It was a 172.16.1.2. As soon as I changed the subnet mask, it updated. It now no longer see, no longer now no longer exists in this router here. So straight away, triggered up though, straight away. Okay, now if I try to ping 172.16.1.2, obviously can't. Okay, that's an example of how it updates straight away. But what we want to do, what I want to do is this. I want to be able to ping that other IP address. Just to keep it safe. Let's um so, okay, and again you will see Okay, where is it? So router EIGRP10. We're going to go now auto summary. Also have it as you can see the writing comp take from there. So if you have a look at the run. We'll see those networks there. But however, if I now go you no know, no no not there. Oh no. See how the major relationship went down? And again, that's because it's not because I've said advertise this route into the IGFP. I've said now I don't want that to participate in the IGFP. Come back up. Okay, so now I have, you'll see that routes are slightly changed. So 172 to 16 at 1 or 0. That's a connected route. Over here, we've got this route by EDP. There's a local IP address. Bingo. So that's where we've got our EIGRP. So from the point of view of configuration for the exam, that's pretty much all you really need to know. That you need an autonomous system number. Watch out for the auto summary. Okay, watch out for the auto summary. Um, and remember uh, the ah, actually that was the other thing I want to talk about. The concept of a passive interface. Okay, so the concept of the passive interface is that. If we have a look at our run, if we have a look at this bit here, it says, as I said before, all those statements are saying is please, if your interface has a IP address that is within that network, participate in OSPF. Now, for instance, 
my loopback, my loopback addresses, there's no point in the loopbacks actually sending out the IGRP updates, is it? Because there's nothing ever going to be connected to it. So what I would do in that case is put in, in a minute, that's all right. I'm going to go out of my first. Apologies. Is you put in this passive interface command, okay? And in this case, I put in passive interface loopback zero, passive interface loopback one. Okay, so that then stops updates from being generated and taking up memory and all that sort of stuff for loopback zero and one. Now it's not going to it's not going to take up any bandwidth because those interfaces are just logical interfaces, but it will take up memory and CPU cycles. So if we turn that off, that will then stop that from happening, but the routes will still be advertised. See, the route table doesn't change, but now those interfaces, the loopback zero and loopback one, are now no longer relevant. So if we use the show IP protocol command, we can see on this one. EIGFP10, router ID, there's the router ID, as I said, in the highest loopback. Routing for networks, blah, blah, blah. Routing information sources, so it's come from gateway 10.2.254. Two, 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 there it is. Okay. So just be aware that there's a passive interface command. And what that does is stops interfaces from participating in the IGRP. Okay? By default, all interfaces will, will participate in EIGRP. Okay? You have to put in the passive interface, uh, interface name to stop it, or alternatively you can do this. You'll see here you can use the default keyword. And that will stop all interfaces. And there we go, there's our neighbor going down. Now in that case, you might say passive interface default, and then you say no passive interface E0 slash zero. And that will then allow that interface to participate. Okay, got a um, question from James. Is it worth disabling auto summary before we start setting up routes? Um, yes. Yep. Um, uh, the, the answer is a bit it depends on the subnets you've got on your network, but generally yes, that would be a good idea to do that. Yep. If, um, you're in the, in the, if you're in the situation where you're using dynamic routing anyway, uh, chances are you're going to have fairly extensive use of subnets um, and there's a possibility that, particularly in an enterprise environment, that you may be using, or probably would be using, the same major class network with lots of little subnets off it. So it would make sense to have auto summary turned off. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So that's our that's our EIGF thing. So OSPF, okay, quickly. OSPF is open shortest path first. Um, when it says open, that doesn't literally mean open this path and head down there. It means it's an open standard. Okay, um, which means, of course, that it's not proprietary for Cisco or anyone else. So it's used by the majority of the vast majority of routing um, vendors. <coughs> so you will see OSPF on lots of different routing platforms, whether it's Juniper, um, Cisco, whoever it is, Huawei, whoever, F5, whatever. You will see OSPF capability. Even in checkpoints, net screens, that sort of stuff, you'll see the ability to do OSPF. You won't see that with EIGFP. Um, it uses a concept of areas which are similar, similar to autonomous systems. Mm, similar. Um, it builds relationships like EIGFP. It has it deals with link status advertisements. Okay, which um, are basically advertisements about the status of links, so not of routes of links, and it sends link state advertisements when a link status changes. Okay, so it's all to do with link statuses, the status of physical links. Um, it uses two multicast addresses in general, 
224.0.0.5, which goes to all OSP operators, all OSP operators listen to that, and 224.0.0.6, which is for a thing called designated routers only. Okay, and we'll have a look at that shortly. Um, it uses a Deutsch algorithm, as I said earlier, and it is a classless protocol, thus supporting VLSM, or variable length submit masks. So it sends submit mask information in the updates. Um, OSPF will only support OP. Okay, so version 4 and version 6, it doesn't do Apple Talk, um, IPX, those sort of things. Um, OSPF version 3 is what you would use for um, IPv6. It has an administrative distance of 110. Its cost is metric. Um, so the cost is, sorry, the metric is the cost. I'm going to write there in a minute. So it doesn't use a hop count, it uses a cost which is generally based on the speed of links. And there is no hop count limit. So it can go as far as we want. Um, it's similar to EIGRP in that, sorry, I'm going too far. It's similar to EIGRP in that it uses a neighbor table, which again contains a list of all the neighbors. Topology table contains a list of all the possible routes that it knows about. And then lastly, the routing table, which is the best route for each network. Again, similar to EIGRP in that it forms adjacencies, um, but those routers have to be in the same area. Okay? Now with OSPF, you can have multiple processes running, so what they call a process ID, um, but all routers that talk to each other must be within the same area. Okay, so they form noble relationships, again called adjacencies. Um, they're, they're formed by exchanging hello packets to the multicast address of 224.0.0.5, which I said before is all routers. Um, each router has is identified by its own unique router ID. So the router ID is determined in one of three ways. So the best way is to manually specify it. So you as an administrator say, this is what I want the router ID to be. If you don't manually specify it, it will take the highest IP address configured on any loopback interface. So if you've got 10 loopbacks, um, whichever is the highest IP on a loopback will be the router ID. If you don't have any loopbacks, then it will just take the highest physical IP address. Okay, so loopbacks first. Now it doesn't matter if you've got a physical address that's got a higher IP than any loopback you've got on, it will still use the loopback one if it actually exists. So it'll send 10 second hellos on broadcast, so when I say broadcast I mean things like Ethernet, or point to point networks, so just back to back router connections, and it will send them on 30 seconds for non-broadcast or point to multi-point interfaces, so things like ATM, phone relay, that sort of stuff. Note, um, by default, the dead interval timer, which remember is how long do I wait before I remove my neighbor from the table, the dead interval timer is four times whatever the hello interval is. Okay? And again, they can be adjusted on a per interface basis. You must adjust both at the same time, otherwise you'll get issues. Now to form an adjacency, the following have to be identical on each router. The yeah, area ID, the area type, which there's, and we won't go into detail too much of that because you only need to worry about single area OSPF for the exam. Um, but the area type can be stubby, not so stubby. Oh, there's a lot. Um, prefix, so the prefix on the, um, the actual interface must match. The mask must match. The hello interval and the dead timer must match. The network type, so whether it's broadcast, point to point, non-broadcast, multi-access, point to multi-point, whatever. And if you've got authentication set, that also has to match, obviously, as well. So the neighbor table is constructed similarly with EIGRP, um, constructed from the Hello Packet, which contains the router ID of each neighbor, the state of each neighbor, the local interface connected to each neighbor, and the IP address interface of that neighbor. Okay, so that's the actual physical IP address on the interface that's sending out the update. So OSPF designated routers are something you need to understand. And basically, in multi-access networks, 
like an Ethernet network. So you, you can have a lot of different neighbors. So you might have 20 routers that are doing OSPF. If you've got that and every single OSPF router is a neighbor with every other single OSPF neighbor, you can see that quite quickly that would get quite high. So in this case, the formula for working that out would be n bracket n minus 1 divided by 2. So if we have 20 routers, it would be 20 times 19 divided by 2. So that would give you the number of routing relationships that you would have. So that gives us uh, what, uh, 40, um, uh, about 190. Okay, so it's a lot of relationships. Okay, so, so having that many adjacencies therefore leads you to a lot of link state address updates, a lot of traffic. And if one router drops off, bang, everyone's telling everyone else about it. So you can suddenly get uh, into a similar situation as you would with distance vector routing where you get lots and lots and lots of updates. So we have this concept, um, this concept of a designated router, which limits the traffic. So what happens is OSPF will elect a designated router. Okay, and that's that's um, that's based on a priority. Okay, so a priority that you can either manually set or by default is um, it will work out. But uh, by default is 255. Okay, and if there is a tie in the priority then whichever router has the highest router ID, so again, whichever router has the highest loopback address or if it's manually set, whatever the ID is, that will become the designated router. You can change the priority just as you can change everything else. Okay. So the other thing to remember about it is that it's not preemptive. So that means if you add another router in later on and you give it a high priority, it won't take over Okay, until the designated router that's already set drops off, and then it may take it. Then it'll rehold the election bang in the come. Now the designated router assumes a multicast address of 224.0.0.6, and we'll see why that's important in a minute. Um, during the election process, a backup designated router is also elected for redundancy, obviously. Um, and that one will will preempt. If the designated router goes off on, it will automatically take over. And then every other router, all the other OSPF routers, then basically just deforms adjacency with the designated router and the backup designated router. So if you were to look at the neighbor table on OS on an IOSPF network with 20 routers, you would see 18 of those routers would have relationships with just the DR and the BDR. But the DR and BDR would have relationships with all of the other routers. Okay, so it just limits the complexity a little bit. Okay, so neighbor states. The quicker we go through our neighbor states, so uh, down indicates that no LOs have been heard from the neighboring router. So once you put the neighbor statement in to say this is a neighbor, um, it will show in a down state until such time as it hears a hello from that neighbor. The init state indicates a hello packet has been heard from the neighbor but that two-way communication has not yet been initialized. So uh, it, it's got a packet, but it hasn't yet heard whether the router at the other end has got its packet yet. Okay. So two-way is the next state. It indicates that that bidirectional communication is now up. Okay. So recall, if you remember, that the hello packet contains a neighbor field. So communication is considered two-way once a router sees its own router ID in its neighbor's hello packet. <coughs> and this, at this two-way start, this is where the designated and the backup designated routers are left. Okay. The X start means exchange start. So that means that the routers are preparing to share their link state information, Okay, to start building their topology table. The exchange status indicates that the routers are exchanging information. Okay, so they're in the process of building their topology table. And routers will examine those exchange packets from each neighbor to determine if it has any information that needs to know about. Okay, so loading indicates the routers are finally exchanging their link state advertisements containing information specifically 
about all the links connected to each other. Okay, so essentially they're sharing their topology table. They've built their own topology table and they're sharing it with each other. Then last of all, the best state to be in is full, and that indicates that the routers are fully synchronized. Okay, the topology table of all routers in the area should now be exactly the same. Depending on the role of the neighbour, the state may appear as one of three things. So it can show up as a full slash DR, and that indicates that the neighbour that we're talking to is a designated router. Okay? Now obviously that only shows up in a broadcast or point to point. Oh, sorry, broadcast environment. Um, it will show up as a full BDR, which will indicate that the neighbour is a backup designated router. Okay? Or it'll show up as full drubber, yes, drubber, D R O V, indicating that the neighbour is neither a designated router or a backup designated router. Okay, so on your multi-access networks, they'll only form full adjacencies. Okay, so if you've got if you've got no backup, you've got no DRs and no BDRs, it'll just form full adjacencies. That's it. That's all you'll see. Um, if you're if they're a non-DR router or non-BDR router, they'll still form adjacencies with each other, but they'll remain in a two-way state. Okay, they won't go any further than that because you're not a designated router, you're not a BDR or a DR or a BDR, so I don't want to talk exclusively with you. I'll just remain in the two-way state, which means that if I lose my DR or my BDR, I've got an option of exchanging information with you, but I'm not going to until that time. Okay, so network types. Broadcast multi-access includes any topology where broadcast occurs. So, for example, Ethernet, token ring, not that it exists anymore, but that's an example that you may see an exam, and ATM. Okay. OSPF in these circumstances will elect DRs and BDRs <coughs> and will use 224.0.0.6 to communicate to those DRs and BDRs. Uh, neighbours, in that example, neighbours don't need to be manually specified. Okay, it will pick it up, OSPF will pick it up itself. So point to point indicates it's a topology where two routers are just connected back to back. Okay, so it could be a point to point T1 link or an E1 link in Australia. Um, and again, it won't, in this case, it won't elect DRs and BDRs, and all traffic will simply use 2.4.0.0.5. But again, you don't need to specify neighbours because you've got that point-to-point, -point, back to back relationship. It's only one, you know, you can't have anything else. Point to multipoint, uh, this is where you've got one interface can connect to multiple um, destinations, and each connection between a source and a destination is treated as a separate point-to-point -point link. So an example would be phone relay. Okay? So OSPF again will not elect DRs and BDRs. All OSPF traffic is sent to 224.0.0.5 and neighbours don't need to be manually specified. Last of all, specialist. Okay? Non-broadcast multi-access. Um, indicates a topology where an interface can connect to multiple destinations. However, we can't send broadcasts out. Okay, so it's not like the previous example, which was point to multi-point phone relay. Okay, this is multi-access non-broadcast. So we can't send broadcasts, so it can't see each other. So again, this would be just normal phone relay. Not point to multi-point phone relay, just phone relay. In this case, OSPF will elect DRs and BDRs, but you must manually define the OSPF neighbors. Okay? Thus, all your traffic will be unicast instead of multicast. Because no broadcasting, no multicasting, multicast hellos are not allowed, you've got to specify the individual individual routes. Okay, so hierarchies. If we look at the hierarchies of OSPF now. And we'll only go through this very, very quickly because you don't really need to know too much about this for the exam. So OSPF though is a hierarchical system that separates autonomous systems into individual areas. Okay? So OSPF traffic, it can be the intra-area, so in other words contained within one area, or it can be inter-area between multiple areas, or it can be external altogether, which is from another autonomous system. They build our OSPF routers, as we said, build the topology database of all links within the area. 
and all areas within that area will have the same topology database. Routing updates between those routers only contain the information about links local to the area. This limits the topology database to include only the local area and because of that it concerns the bandwidth and reduces your CPU loads. Okay? So area zero always exists. So this is the main area you have to know about for the CCNAs in. It always exists and it's always required for OSPF to function. If you don't have area zero, you don't have OSPF. It's considered the backbone. As a rule, all other areas must have a connection into area zero, although there is a special thing called virtual links which will bypass that. Again, you don't have to worry about that for CCNA. So area zero is often referred to as a transit area. Okay, because as in this diagram, router B and F, if they want to communicate to router A and B, they have to go through area zero. Um, OSPF routers, as you can see by router C and D, can belong to multiple areas. And for each area, they will contain a separate topology database. Okay? Um, when they're in that case, they're known as area border routers. Whereas router E and F and A and B are just called internal routers because they're only members of those specific areas. Okay, so OSPF router types. We've got the internal routers, which again only exist in one area. We have an area border router, which we saw before, contains interfaces in at least two separate areas. We have a backbone router, which is a C and D. They're backbone routers because they have at least one interface in area zero, which is the backbone area. And we have autonomous system border routers, which we haven't got an example on here, but if, for instance, there was another router out here that connected to router A that was in a different autonomous system, that would then make <coughs> router A an autonomous system border router. Or autonomous system boundary routers. Okay, so with all that in mind, with the basic OSPF out of the way, let's have a look at a simple example of a lab for OSPF and have a look at a few of the commands. So if we go back to our lab, now we'll leave our, our uh, we'll leave our EIGRP there. And we'll just see I'm going to route bingo. Okay, so we see we've got our D routes, uh, EIGRP routes still there. So we're going to configure OSPF as well. Ah, not there we Matthew. Okay, sorry. Conf mode, router, OSPF, and if you have a question mark, it says process ID. Okay, so we're just going to go process one. Now this is sort of analogous to an autonomous system, but in, in um, OSPF it's called the process ID. So, <clears throat> first thing is, oh, well, let's just leave it there. Okay, so let's, let's see what our network statement is here. So network number, okay, so we want to participate, we want the 10.2.2.0 network to participate in OSPF routing. Now let's just have a look here. We also have to put in OSPF wildcard bits. Okay, if I just put it on that, it says incomplete command. So we can't just put in the network address like we did with the IGRP. We have to actually put in a subnet mask. Now these are a wildcard mask, so it's not that, that's a subnet mask, it's a wildcard mask, which is a direct opposite to a subnet mask. So in this case, that, okay, so that's a wildcard mask, direct like you would use in a, in an ACL. Now, we also need to plot in the area. Okay, so area. Now remember I said before you have to have areas here. Now it's interesting, you can Look at the area numbers you can have. Anything from that huge number there. Crazy. Or you can actually use it as an, you can actually put it as an IP address. All that being the case, you always have to have area zero anyway. <coughs> now because this is our first area, we have to put in area zero. And okay, done. For that number. Now if we put in our loop back as well. 
0, .0, .0, .0 this time because I want it to be the actual host route and we're going to pop that into area 0 as well. Because I could put in a different area but we're only looking at single area OSPF at the moment. Okay. So is that enough? Let's see what happens. So if we go show IP protocols now, you'll see we've got ERGRP no, running, we know that. Okay, we don't care about ERGRP now. We care about OSPF. So we've got OSPF1 running. Notice the um, router ID, 172.16.1.1. Because I didn't specify it, it um, just took the highest IP address. And they're saying it's routing for 1.1.1.1 and 10.2.10.2.0. Now that's a difference from EIGRP, isn't it? If we look at our, up at EIGRP here, it goes with these numbers here. Okay? This guy here uses a full number. Okay? So it takes, again, it supports VLSM automatically by default, does not summarize. So it's going to go with a full subnet mask. It's going to assume a full subnet mask straight away. Okay? It doesn't auto summarize. So I show IP route. Okay, I don't see anything yet. I go show good command to use. Show IP OSPF neighbor. Okay, I got no neighbor. Let's see if we can get a neighbor going. Out. Configuration. Let me just check on the right neighbor. Okay, there's our IP addresses. Oh, I'm a bit of a silly bug, aren't I? Click on the wrong one. Okay, so. Uh, network. Give them more practice. Okay. So that puts that network in there. Now notice that with the router ID 172.16.1.1, that network doesn't actually have to be uh, set up to be sent out via the routing updates uh, to actually work, to, to actually be used as a router ID. That's not, not a requirement, it doesn't matter. So now, OSPF 1, remember. Area IDs have to match, otherwise the relationship won't come up. Area zero. Network. Oh, look at things happening already. Oh, on to any zeros. Okay, so let's have a look. What have we got? We're out. Okay, there we go. We've still got, okay, not much to happen there. Have a look here. Oop, all right. Let's have a look here. What have we got here? Okay, not much has happened. Not much has happened, has it? So is, is, is OSPF actually running? Okay, we know that OSPF is running there. Okay, we can see OSPF is running there. Notice, see? Highest IP, highest loopback ID. Okay, so um, what's wrong? Why can't we see any OSPF rounds? Let's have a look. IP OSPF neighbor. Okay, we've got, a, we've got a full BDR relationship with that guy. Okay. Okay, and we've got a full DR relationship there. And if we have a look at show IP, ISF, 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 ISF policy. Okay, things things look alright. We can speed things. Yep, okay. Oh, it's okay. So here's a question for you. Why, why am I not seeing any OSPF routes in the table? Now again, this could be a question that you may get on the session exam. So why am I not seeing any? <clears throat> okay, so one answer. Hello and dead intervals are not the same. Okay. 
Well, let's have a look. However, we'll have a minute. Whoop. Shall I pay RSPF? Where would we find that? Let's have a bit of a look. Where do you think you'd find that? Okay, maybe if we just show IP over this view, let's have a look. Okay, so we're getting, see we're getting numbers, we're getting everything in, okay. Have a look at our ISPF, and we have a look at, uh, let's have a, let's have a look at our, let's have a look at our neighbour again. Oh, yeah, so, oh, that looks right. Dead time of third system, okay. okay. Anyone else? Okay, so it's not the, not the dead time of the hello timers. And look at the easy, whoop, very easy, zero, zero. Look at that, let's have a look here. Time intervals, hello, ten, dead, ten. Okay, show, RP, RSF. Oops. What have we done there? Guys, okay, so intervals 10, 40, 45, no, they're match. 10, dead, wait, all matches are okay. Uh, area 2 required, no, not Area 2, we've got a few people that are putting through the, the correct answer, so, <clears throat> okay, so it's nothing to do with timers, because we're all at default, nothing to do with um, router ID, subnet mask, auto summary, anything like that. A um, few people know on head, it's because we have EIGRP running, and if you remember, EIGRP by default has an administrative distance of 90, and OSPF is an AD of 110. So by default, it says, all right, I consider EIGRP to be more trustworthy than OSPF, so I will stick its routes into the routing table first. So the only way to get our OSPF routes in is to turn off the EIGRP. So let's do that. So, uh, there we go. Now we have some OSPF rounds. See the O. Oh, OSPF. <clears throat> and notice we don't have the routes for the loopbacks. That's fine though, it doesn't matter. We don't have to be able to communicate with each other to be able to, um, you don't have to be able to communicate with the loop, uh, with the router ID IP address for RSPF to work. So, useful commands in RSPF. Okay, show IP RSPF neighbor. Okay, and again, these are commands that you will possibly come across in the in the CTN exam. Okay, neighbor ID state full or BDR. Okay, indicates that it's on a point-to-point -point or a broadcast network, which you already know. The dead time, so that is how much time is left before I consider this neighbor down if I don't hear from it. Um, the IP address of the local interface and the interface through which it heard from that neighbor. Okay? Then we've got topology. Now there's not a lot in this because well obviously we only got two routers next to each other. So there's not a lot. So we've got area backbone zero. That's about it. If we just look at show IP OSPF, it gives you a bucket load of information about OSPF, that, that's not so in, um, interesting for the exam. The other one that is interesting though is show IP OSPF interface and the reason that is is because it will show you the priorities, the hello, dead and wait timers. 
and what, who the designated router and who the backup, backup designated routers are. So that's important because if you're in a situation in OSPF um, where you need to troubleshoot what's going on, if you don't use this, as we said before, in the gun for troubleshooting process there, let's have a look at the timers. Okay, if you don't know this command, you can't have a look at the timers. Okay, so you need to be able to find that information because they're all things, these are all things that could be asked in the exam. So we have these, I'll give you these two lots of output, maybe, and they'll say, okay, we can't form a relationship, why? And you have to say, oh, okay, hello time is different, or dead time is different, whatever it is. Um, question about does show IP route OSPF work if EIGF is enabled? Yes, it does. Very good point. Um, you can at any time, so here, you can at any time do show IP route OSPF. And you will see, so if I go back into EIGRP, I'll just do that anyway because I know that's what it wants to do. Okay, so, and you'll see, there we go, our EIGRP routes are back in again, and if I go show, okay, we've got our neighbours, so again, this is the same sort of thing as with OSPF, and again, you can do the show IP, EIGRP, and hit the question mark, and look at topology, um, your neighbours, and just the general settings. Hmm, that's interesting, it should have worked. That is the idea of the Ah, you can put them in one finger. Okay, so for that, so we look at our topology for that process. Okay, so all that, the same sort of thing, all that information is there, same as with your OSPF. But getting back to your question, if you go show OP route OSPF, what's there? Okay, nothing there. Okay, the reason nothing's there is because nothing has come, there's a good question, nothing has come in from the topology table. So if I go show IP OSPF topology, okay, there's your topology there. Now, nothing has come in from the topology table. Why? Because the administrative distances for EIGRP is better than OSPF. So while the routes from the routing table will exist in the topology table, okay, so all the routes that OSPF knows about, it won't actually go into the route table. When you go show OP at OSPF, you can, as I said before, you can absolutely use a command. The command will work, but it won't show anything. The reason it's not showing anything is because there are no routes in OSPF or the in, inside the route table. Because remember, the show IP route looks at the actual route table itself. So even though, yes, great question, great point, you can use a command, unless there's something in there specifically from OSPF, it won't show up. So if, for example, we go into here and we create another loopback, <coughs> and we make an IP address 3.3.3, okay, and we go into router OSPF 1, and we go network, Zero, whoop, so many zeros in. We say zero. And then we go back to here. You'll see that OSPF route turn up there. And if we do show route not bad, especially when you've got when you haven't got no domain lookup working, that'll take ages of time out now. Okay. There it is. There. So that route, though, will only remember that particular keyword. Any of those keywords on the end of the show IP route command 
are only used as a filter. Okay, so it doesn't say look into the um, topology. It says have a look at the actual route table and filter it from there. Okay, so I hope that answers that question. Okay, so for the purposes of today, uh, that's the end of our slideshow, that's the end of our lecture. Uh, so next week um, we'll be talking about IP services and some security. Uh, also Jason Howarth from Charles Sturt Uni will be coming online uh, briefly at the start of it to talk a little bit about uh, the other courses available um, by Charles Sturt Uni. So uh, basically until next week, um, that's it. So thank you very much for those who attended. I'll get the um, uh, any resources. There are, well, there are already resources up on the Moodle website. Um, the recording will be up uh, within the next uh, few hours. Um, just to answer some questions, a lot of people have been posting uh, where can I find the link to the webinar, where can I find the resources. Um, all of them are under the CCNA course page. So if we go to here, under your Cisco, so when you log into Moodle, under your Cisco CCNA course page, you will see they are all, whoop, okay, so we logged out, log back in again. Okay, they're all here. So underneath the Cisco CCNA course, you'll see resources. So in that resource folder is all the resources that I post up for each week. Um, I'll have the webinar slides, three to a page with notes, or single slide per page only, and then the webinar link is also there. Now, um, as far as other video formats go, my advice is to uh, download something like Freemate Converter, uh, which will allow you to automatically download from YouTube as you watch and it will convert it into whatever format you like. Um, I've tried a couple of different formats up. Um, people have said they've had trouble with audio. Um, the audio has always been in the, in the actual webinar itself. So I, I think probably the best way forward is for me to put it up on the uh, YouTube and you guys to be able to download it and convert it into whatever format you like. Okay, so thank you very much. As I said, next week we'll be looking at IP services and security. Uh, so our week four and Jason Howarth will be coming in to talk about uh, some of the other course options you have um, with the IT Masters through Charles Sturt Uni. So until then, uh, thank you very much and we'll um, hear from you all next week. Okay, bye now.